so Julian Assange figured out a key component of the sociology of war. Here it is. One of the hopeful things that I've discovered is that nearly every war that has started in the past 50 years has been a result of media lies. The media could have stopped it if they had searched deep enough, if they hadn't reprinted government propaganda, they could have stopped it. But what does that mean? Well, that means basically populations don't like wars and populations have to be fooled into wars. Populations don't willingly and with open eyes go into a war. So if we have a good media environment, then we will also have a peaceful environment. What is important about his observation is that you need certain mechanisms in society in order to sell war to populations, especially to uh, democratic societies, but also, also to all other societies. When you, whenever you have a war, you need a large part of society, at least, at least the people who carry the weapons and then do the killing, you need them to be to be actually on your side, right? You need, you need them to believe that what you're saying about the current political situation is correct and that they need to run into the battle and kill the other guys and women and in extreme cases kill everybody from a from a ethnic group to that the point that you know only genocide will uh, will reach the the goal that we want which is what we're seeing right now in between Israel and Gaza and, and Palestine but the point is that you need to sell you need to sell a a very particular view of the world and a view of the world that is not inherent to people. Um, the, Julian Assange is very, very right about that. Um, people, by default, they want to get along with each other. They want to share food. Uh, if, you, if you step into a stranger's house, most often the first thing you get asked is, uh, do you want something to drink or have you eaten? Our prime, our, our basic instinct when we meet people in an environment where we are not threatened and where we feel safe is to get along with others. That's what we teach kids, right? But then, but then if you put us into very large groups uh, like nation states and, and bigger and like the entire global society, then suddenly something breaks down. Suddenly the... Um, suddenly some mechanisms start kicking in that then lead to war. So really, whenever we see war, we, un we must understand that the social, sociological mechanisms that have convinced entire populations that war is a necessary uh, component of uh, moving forward politically has already taken place, right? So um, the media is one of these components. Another one is, of course, in, for the U.S., the military-industrial complex. But, you know, think it in a bigger term, right? Think about the entire military industry in the West, but also in other countries, that if they produce monetary incentives for politicians and business leaders to go along with, um, with processes that then, that then lead to their products being used, then you create another one of these components of the sociology of war, um, which then plays back into other, other um, components of the social structure, like think tanks, like universities, uh, when suddenly it becomes a crime to say that, uh, that, that a peaceful resolution of a conflict or a peaceful way forward of negotiations would be the right thing and, and professors are being kicked out of universities and stuff like that. We see that time and again. And it's just this part that I want to discuss this, um, these thought processes that are either conducive to war or thought processes that are conducive to halting the phenomenon of war. So, for instance, the argument that um, we are forced to do X. The other side did something and therefore the only option left is fighting. That is a very uh, simple belief and argument then for justifying the use of weapons, right? So this is something, this is the, the thing that I call the logic of war. We have, we have these, these tendencies to then associate narratives that we are fed in the media with problem-solving solutions. 
That's why the narratives are so important. That's why Julian Assange put so much emphasis on media. That's why he published all the lies of the US and the West, right? And this is why he's in prison. He's in prison not because he, he lies, he's in prison because he said the truth, because he revealed things that damage the narratives. And all states do that. All great powers who want to be able to use military might for their gain need to be able to somehow sell certain narratives about what the world is to their populations. Um, the, the link that where we can break it is either we break it on the narrative level and find ways to actually um, uh, circulate unbiased information, uh, which is why <laughs> You know, the US right now is cracking down on TikTok. The US is cracking down on, on other um, media platform, uh, the, the European Union as well. China has closed, I mean, it's close to Google. China is not a free information space, Russia neither. So uh, great powers need to control the information space. It's, it's, it's a prerequisite of, um, of, of control and of, uh, of the logic of war to take place in the, in the end. So um, this is absolutely, I think, a very natural phenomenon and not even one, I think, guided by malign influence, by the malign wishes, but I think it's probably more the outcome of a natural process of how large groups of people live together. We have this bug in the system that in two large groups we start going to, to war and we start producing these sociological mechanisms that then result in war. So the first way to break this is with media. This is what Julian Assange tried to do with uh, WikiLeaks and so on. The second approach is to beware of the fallacies of the logic of war. Because even if you're sold a certain narrative, the one, the one point where critical thinking can still stop you from buying in to the war narrative is when you recognize that certain logical patterns or ways of making, after you made sense of the world, certain chain, a, a logical chain, right, um, that exists, that there's a logical chain that you go through and that leads you to the only possible answer, which is war. Here are my examples. If you believe the Western narrative that uh, on the February 24th, 4th, 2022, um, Vladimir Putin got crazy and just invaded Ukraine uh, because he's crazy and evil. Well, then the logical conclusion is we need to stand up to this, especially if you believe that the next target is going to be Poland and so on. The only, the only logical conclusion is we need to stand up to this. We need to fight. There it is. This chain reaction, right? From a narrative to a conclusion. The other one on the, on the Russian side, of course, is if you believe that NATO expansion is such a huge threat to your country that you have no other choice but to fight. Well, then you must fight. The same thing, the same logic applies for both sides of the narrative, right? And I'm not judging whether, whether one of the two narratives is right, right? Uh, uh, okay. I'm just, I'm just pointing out that uh, there are, there are ways of, um, it, this is, um, uh, deductive reasoning that then lead you to to judge that violence, military violence is needed. Take Haiti at the moment. The, the mainstream Western neocon narrative is that Haiti is in utter disarray. The Haitians are unable to sort out their own affairs. The uh, thugs and gangs on the street are taking over control. Um, if Haiti itself, if the people are not able to protect themselves from from, destruct, from destroying themselves, then you need an outside intervention force. And that's what the neocons are working on right now. Right, so there's this deductive, there's this deduction, this very logical chain, uh, chain of thoughts that then leads you to military intervention. Um, now, this is the other level on which we can resist. This is why I keep emphasizing that the logic of neutrality does the opposite. The logic of neutrality says, I don't know which side is right. I have not enough ways of judging whose narrative is correct. Therefore, I'm just not going to participate. And as soon as you don't participate, you actually take out one, one element that could make wars worse. The logic of neutrality doesn't get rid of wars. 
it just prevents them from spreading to a certain extent. It might also be very, very mean and unfair because you uh, naturally don't help the victim. But the question is, who's the victim? <laughs> because both sides in a the war, they always claim that they're the victim. So I leave you with this, that don't just be mindful of the narratives that you're sold. Be mindful of, the, of, your, own, of your own reasoning and when your reasoning actually says that I'm, well, we need to fight, then you have been sold war. Um, the question then is, is it, is it right or not? And I cannot answer that. I just want to point this out. We have the narrative level and we have the logical level, the argumentative level, the, de the deductive level on which um, war and violence in our minds becomes possible.